Good afternoon. How you doing today? Hope your week has been going good. You're almost at the weekend. Hang in there. Real quick before we start the show, uh, if you have an Alexa, all you got to do is like say, hey, Alexa, play Adobe Radio, and then boom, Adobe Radio is playing. Um, Michael, how was your week, man? It's been good. Been yeah. real good. Yeah, you got some good stuff coming up. Yeah, hopefully. So hopefully Fingers some crossed. good news to report in the coming weeks. Yes, sir. Yeah, start off 2020 with a big bang. Uh, currently, um, I'm working on Good Girls, which has been going great. Very exciting. Yeah, and then I'll be uh, airing. It'll be airing in next year for season three, and I got a great uh, recurring guest spot on there, which I think all of you will enjoy. Uh, let's just get into it. Uh, our guest today is someone who I was super excited about having on the show. He is from the uh, Delia family, Matt Delia. And he has a great podcast on the Apple podcast charts called Matt D'Elia is Confused. Without further ado, let's give it up for Matt D'Elia. Shit. Yeah. William made it. Can I say shit? Oh, yeah, yeah. You okay. can curse. You can say whatever you'd like on it. You can say fuck? Yeah. Yeah. Does that free you up a little bit? Yeah, for sure. I mean, 100%. It, it's much better, I feel like. I, I say those words very often in my regular life. Mm. So... I like to ask ahead of time. Although we were already recording when I said shit, like within two words. So yeah. if that wasn't, it would have been good to learn early, but I'm glad I can say it. Yeah. We talked about it earlier, uh, but you mentioned that uh, you're an aggressive driver as well. Yeah. And yeah. I appreciate that. I think you have to be. If you're not driving aggressively, you fuck it up for everybody else who's trying to get somewhere. Mm. And I think that's more disrespectful. Mm. Like you get cut off by someone aggressive is, is less annoying than when someone's going way too slow in front of you. Yeah. You know, and that to me is this is this is the ultimate signal that it's better to be an aggressive driver. You know what I mean? Hundred percent. Yeah. Also, for the fact that we live in Los Angeles, it's a yeah. big city. Yeah. Everybody's busy. Yes. It's not the time for a casual drive. William, if you look at me like that, about me, I'm gonna go crazy right now. Yeah. <laughs> I, did he look at you in a bad way, or yeah. were you looking for him looking at you in a bad way? No, I felt him I looked, looking at me. I looked when you said it, and he looked fine. Uh, that's oh, you don't know him. That okay. he has this little smirk where he's like, "I don't know, you always help." All right. Anyway, all right. I'm um, kind of on his side though. I'm just fucking saying. That's disappointing. All right. <laughs> Not about the aggressive driving or the driving in general, but about the look. I didn't see the look. Okay, get to know him some more. All right, get to know him some more. I'll keep an uh, eye on him. Uh, first of all, congratulations on the podcast. Thanks, man. Yeah, it's a big hit. And yeah, that's it's amazing. doing good. Yeah, it's doing well. Thanks. Yeah, and thanks for listening too. Yeah, it's been fun. It's uh. I mean, you've been doing it a long time, so maybe you forget. But when you start doing it, it's 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 kind of it's a strange experience to be put in the because you're having conversations your whole life, and then you start having conversations for a specific reason. Mm. And the first few, you're kind of like, "What the f- how how do I do this?" Because you know you, you don't want to just be like you talking to somebody. Like you want to have the purpose of talking to that person for that reason. You know what I mean? And it's just. It was a weird getting going, but at the same time, people really understood what the podcast was about very quickly. So it, it was this weird thing where people were getting it, but I was like, what am I doing kind of thing, you know? And I feel like I'm in a groove now, and I don't know if you can tell in those first few, but I was really like, I don't know what I'm doing, you know? But uh, that went away pretty quick, and now I feel like I know what I'm doing. I got the sense that you were new to it, but right. not in a bad way. Sure, yeah, yeah. Like you're interesting enough and you have like common sense and you're you're intelligent enough where it was still interesting. Right. But the evolution of the show yeah. has gone into a very interesting place. And we talked about it briefly <clears throat> out here where I was like, man, you've got a lot of patience. Yeah. And I really appreciate the episode you did shortly after um, the Flat Earther, uh, D- uh, Daryl Marble. Yeah, Daryl Marble, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and again – all respect. Everybody has sure, their point yeah. of view and everything. But I was really glad you did that episode because during the Flat Earther episode, mm-hmm. I'll be honest with you, I had to pause it yeah. and like listen to it in chunks. I was getting so frustrated. Yeah. And for you to just take the standpoint of just letting this person talk about yeah. their view, yeah. I think is it, it's, it's very interesting. It takes a lot of patience. Yeah. I mean, obviously, and with him too, you know, it's good to let him know up front, I don't agree with you at all. Yeah. And then- also, though, tell, you know, the idea, uh, the idea for the show in general is to bring on people generally who either can clear up something that confuses me 
or people who confuse me and their beliefs. And obviously Daryl, his beliefs confuse me. And I wasn't going to f- figure out more about him or the way his mind works if I was just going to argue with him and tell him what I believe or, or rather know to be the truth. You know, Just because he's wrong doesn't make me... He's not going to change his mind. Like Whatever I have to say about the fucking earth being round is is not as good as whatever he already heard Neil deGrasse Tyson say about the earth and didn't believe anyway. So it's like, if he's not going to believe Neil deGrasse Tyson or anyone else, any science book, anyone, I'm not going to win that argument. So like, why engage in the argument at all, you know? And so the thinking with him and other guests like that, it's just like, I appreciate them coming on the show, especially because they know up front, I don't, it's not a friendly, it's friendly, I'm friendly, but it's not like a friendly philosophically i don't and ideologically i just disagree with a lot of these people right but i'd rather know what's going on in their mind the ways that they think than tell them what i think and try to make them believe what i think or even worse which i think is even more common is like to invite someone on the show that you disagree with and try to make them look stupid while they're on the air it's like i get people might want to hear that but if you hear it enough and i've heard it a lot it's so such a common approach now. It's just it's it gets boring, you know. It's rude. Yeah, it's rude, and you also don't get anything from it, you know. Well, I, the, the I've had people come on the show, mm-hmm. and I totally disagree yeah. with them in terms of the, uh, certain liberal views, let's sure. say. And I my problem with this one t- particular person was like I just don't like the way you're approaching me about. Mm the way you want to be addressed, Mm -hmm. which I don't mind, you know, people who want to be addressed in any kind of way. Sure. But it was the aggressive nature of Mm. that. And there was a part of me that was like, Oh, this is going to be so weird if we continue on this path. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. Do you know what I mean? Because I'm just going to get angrier and be like, Hey, you're being aggressive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it just, it leads to nowhere. Yeah. So that's kudos to you for that, for having that patience and that awareness, because dude, we live in a time where that is, extremely rare yeah it's kind of going away you know uh everybody's got such a strong opinion everybody's sort of subscribing to what their tribe already believes because they believe it they mm-hmm. just fall right in line and i i'm not like that and i i don't i actually don't really mind that other people are like that but i'm not like that mm-hmm. and so because it it seemed like there might be a hole in in uh or a gap in the world of podcasts where there was a place for that, that I wasn't finding podcasts like that. And I was, I came up with the idea before I thought I was going to do it. And then I was actually talking to my brother about it a while ago before, obviously before I started. And he was like, you, you should just do that. Mm. And I was like, I guess I should, you know? And then we started reaching out to guests and to their credit. And surprisingly, even before we were aired, there were a lot of guests like Joe Walsh, the, the um, tea party Republican who's mm-hmm. trying to primary against Trump fucking good luck he like these kinds of people were very up to have this kind of conversation and that sort of made me know it might it might go well and guests have been really responsive in general to to the 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 style of 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 interview you know um because they feel safe even if if someone feels safe they're going to tell you more about what they think and if you're arguing with them and pushing back on them they're just going to hit the talking points. They're not going to let you dive deep. They're not going to really let you learn about what they're, what they're about, you know? And it's not like you're trying to change people, but the only way any mind is ever going to change is if you approach it with this sort of more expansive way than just being like, I think this, you think that you're fucking wrong. You know, it just doesn't work anymore. No. I'm wondering if you had this kind of illumination, um, you come from a filmmaker background. Yeah. You're a writer, yeah. actor, not actor anymore. Writer director now. Yeah. Writer director yeah. primarily, but you have acted. I have. I okay, have. I have. Cool. Yeah. And I don't know when this illumination happened, but it happened maybe like two or three years living in Los Angeles, mm-hmm. where you know you're. I've been studying acting for a while already, and then you start realizing, oh, this actor or this character. When you're breaking down a character, why are they making these choices? Yeah. Okay. Uh, circumstances, the way they grew up or what they want. or mm-hmm. Then all of a sudden, a, a light switch flipped and I started looking at other people mm. with that kind of like interrogational lens. Right, yeah. I'm like, oh, 
why do you make those choices? Yeah. Why do, where do you come from? Oh, that's why you're being an asshole. Yeah. Oh, I don't really hate you that much anymore, right. knowing the kind of upbringing you had. Ah, oh, okay, good luck to you. And almost this like empathetic, em- yeah. empathetic uh, side started coming out more and more and more. Yeah. And I think that might be an edge also with with your show, having this <laughs> storytelling sure, background, yeah. you know? Yeah, I mean, that's a good point, actually. I mean, I, I, I guess as a writer, you're kind of always... <clears throat> You know, to use an example, I feel like when you're writing a typical like bad guy, that g- bad guy doesn't think he's bad. You know, it's not like anybody's out there in the world thinking, you know what I'm going to do today? I'm going to be bad. They think they're justified, even if it's their brain doing fucking gymnastics, figuring out a way to not feel like they're being bad. They don't feel like they're being bad. Nobody does. And so when you disagree with somebody out in the world and you feel like they're being a piece of shit, they don't think that, you know, and so that alone tells you something and it's that everybody whether it's valid or not they believe they have a reason to be the way they're being and that as an actor is a good thing to understand as a writer it's a good thing to understand but i think in life it's harder to remember because in the abstract it's easy to be like yeah everybody's coming from a place that experientially is probably valid even if it's the bad or wrong thing to do in the world but i i don't think when you're dealing with people like that and someone's pissing you off or saying something you disagree with strongly or, or, or anything like that, you don't, your instinct isn't to remember that your instinct is to fight back or whatever the fuck it is. You know what I mean? To be defended against it. But, and you know, you can be too empathetic, but I don't know. It is increasingly how I feel just everybody, wherever they're coming from is probably, (laughs) you know, they don't, they don't think they're being stupid, bad, shitty, evil, anything. They think they're being good. You yeah. Know? And it's, it's good to remember that. Yeah. I think balance is appropriate yeah. for each situation. It's hard to dial that in for each individual mm-hmm. interaction and experience you have. Yeah. And that's part of the practice of it, I feel. You, lead, you live a more sane life when yeah. you do. Yeah. Like, I know we were just talking about us getting pissed off driving yeah. or getting annoyed. Um, there is a... Uh, a practice, uh, and believe it or not, William, I do try to practice this every once in a while, and I'm trying to be more aware of it. I got it from Jocko Willink. It's called yeah. No Face. Okay. And so try to have, like, when something crazy happens in front of you, in a car, just have no face. Just yeah. be like, okay, that happened. Yeah. I'm still safe. Cool. I'm thankful for that. I'm just going to keep going. Yeah. And it's actually a lot more pleasurable. But, again, it's difficult to maintain it that. It is, you know? yeah. Part of the practice, though. I, I think also there's this, there's this allure of... It's, it feels it, – it seems like it's going to feel good to get angry sometimes. It seems like it's, it's going to feel good to act out the outrage or whatever it is. But the problem is when you act it out, it tends to like last and have mm-hmm. legs. You know, The no-face thing I haven't heard, but Jocko is a really smart guy, and I, I'm a big fan of his. But that's the kind of thing. It, it's similar to something like meditation. It's just like you're trying to stay – level in the face of whatever's coming at you whether it's fucking terrible or you, great or whatever yeah how do you stay level uh drugs yeah no um <laughs> practice i guess yeah i mean uh i i i haven't always been like this that's for sure i mean when i was young i think when i was young really everything did piss me off you know and it, and and it's not that it's not that my mind has changed about the things in the world my reaction to to it has changed though you know because it's it's more about as i've gotten older it's like fucking shit brings you to your knees you know and you're just like you realize you can't fucking change all of the things that are upsetting you the only thing that you can actually change and this sounds like a cliche but it the reason it sounds like a cliche is because people say it a lot because it's true the only thing you can really change or affect in any way is what you're doing you know percent and and if if my young self it it did feel good to be angry about all those things and that's why I did it. It just stopped feeling as good. And it was just like it grew tiresome, it grew exhausting for me. And I'm assuming the people around me. And and it's kind of like, what is this getting me? You know, it's not it doesn't even feel good anymore. You know? It's just like actually any drug. It's when you start, it feels great. And then by the time you settle in with the habit, you're like, I just feel shittier than I did before I started taking that drug, you know. Mm. So it's not really a solution. The, the, that kind of reactive stuff, it just doesn't... 
it doesn't help me anymore. You know, right. it just was getting my way. What was the turning point for you then? Because this is actually one of the things I, I have written down here. I, I wanted to talk to you about, which I think you'd appreciate. Um, I've noticed in the world, some people haven't really evolved past certain stages in their life. For instance, how I was in high school mm-hmm. is very different than how I was the last three years in college. Right. And then it's it's very different how I am now. Yeah. I'm like, I'm like, who was? Oh my God. How yeah. did I not die? Yeah. You know what I mean? I agree with that. And oh, yeah. I feel like some people, that critical point for whatever reason didn't happen for mm. them or it did happen and they chose to ignore it. Yeah. And they just stay it. Because you've met those people who are like, oh, yeah. dude, you're acting like you're in, in high school. Yeah. So what's going what's going on up here? Yeah. When was that critical point for you then? I um I after college i actually got really sick for a couple years and i my life was very different before i got sick and after i got sick and that two-year period was sort of i think when uh, i think that was that turning point when you know as i was a young person not really uh, able to be in the world not not even struggling out in the world. Like I actually wasn't able to really try to do much. I was, I, I can tell you the whole story, but just in brief, it was, it was, I had like th- three surgeries, two emergency, two of them emergency in the span of like six months, all from the neck up. It was like what? a weird sinus thing that led to like just many complications. And so from this, I lost like 30 pounds. It was just like, Shit. it was never like, Sorry, I don't want to be too intrusive. And yeah. if you don't, whatever you don't want to talk about, was it like a bacterial infection, or is it? It, it was a chronic uh, bacterial infection, meaning it literally oh. was never not there. So, and you know, they'd show me these X-rays or MRIs, whatever the fuck, of my head, and they would like show me where this infection was, and they were like, "We can't get it unless we do surgery." And then, and then in the surgery, they were going to correct the problem that was causing it to allow the infection to stay there in the first place. So it was like they were going to fix the infection. I was going to use a gross term, but let's just use that. Yeah. Fix the infection and then sort of fix the fucking waterworks of my face so everything could work on on its own, you know. So that was the first surgery, but then the infection moved down to my tonsils and one night I went uh I went to a dinner and by the end of the dinner I was I went there feeling fine, by the end of the dinner I had like 103 fever and uh it couldn't move. Luckily, it was a Sunday night, and in the morning, I w- went to my doctor, and my fever was like 104. I was driven there, and uh, it was like 8 a.m. We get in the office, and I didn't have an appointment. It was like an emergency thing. Uh, at, th- at the same time, I didn't think I was dying. I just thought I got sick really quick, and um, he took a look down my throat. This is the guy that had done the surgery and was like, we need to operate. And I was like, okay, well, when? How and old he, are you? I'm sorry. How old was I then? Yeah. Um, I guess like 22, 23, oh, okay, 22, yeah. 23, young. And uh, he, I was like, when? I mean, I, I couldn't swallow. I was in so much pain, such a shitty fever. It was just like everything was going wrong. But I just thought I was sick again, yeah. you know? And he was like, we now. He, he literally cleared his entire office out. Other patients, he made them get out. And I was like, well, why are you doing that? He gave me one pain pill and was like, we're going to, you have a tonsillary abscess and we're going to cut it out right now. And I was like, I don't know what the fuck that is. And I was like, can it wait? He's like, if we wait maybe two hours, you'll be dead. I was like, what is going on? Anyway, he gives me the pain pill, clears everyone out of the office. Uh, and just like gets these fucking tools that are like f- huge. It looks like he's gonna operate on a fucking horse, you know? And they just go into my mouth. All I can see is their hands sticking the shit in my mouth, B- blood just like spurting out of my mouth. And he's like, I know this hurts, I know this hurts, but I have no choice. And I was like, at that point, I, I gotta say, and I learned this later, it's considered like the most painful thing after uh, childbirth and then kidney stones, operating on a tonsillary abscess because it's, it's what it sounds like. It's like it's literally like a bacterial infection growing on your tonsil, closing your throat off. And to cut it out, they have to like cut cut your throat open, basically. So they did that, and it, it 
in my memory, it didn't hurt that bad. But I think that's because I was so fucked up in the first place. I was just like, whatever you got to do, do it, you know? So the pain was something I, I was welcoming. Like if I just, if that pain started happening right now, I would fucking pass out. But in the moment, it, it, it was clear that the pain was going to lead to some kind of relief yeah, or some health benefit at least. And it definitely did. But, um, I don't think the, the pain wasn't really that, I think I got lucky, but it's still, then I had to have two more surgeries after that. It was just a fucking nightmare. Um, shout out to that doctor. That doctor was, a, was a cool dude. Still is a cool dude. I'm assuming. Yeah. yeah. Unless something happened. But, uh, yeah, that, that was like, that was like 10 years ago, something like that. And, uh, I mean, I got better, and that's end, that's what ended up making leading to me making American Animal, because I was like, I was so, well, sick, and it's obviously about a, a sick guy, and I was also so disillusioned by the fact that I had basically taken like a year, year and a half on the sidelines. I was like, I need to make something, and I made that movie for no money in, in my home. You know, and it's not obviously it's not about me. That person in the movie is nothing like me, but it was very inspired by the feeling of being young and sick and unable to be in the world. You know, as a young person, that's a very strange experience, you know, and it yeah. leads you to some very odd places mentally. Uh, just just the simple fact of being alone so much. Right. You know what I mean? Um that's that's a shock to the, your world. View yeah, for sure, man. Yeah, totally. You know, and before that. Um, I was a pretty typical young fellow. I mean, I, I drank a lot, uh, smoked a lot, was always going out, just a very social person. And then after that, I was like, mm, I don't do that stuff anymore. Not as a conscious choice. It was just such a long period. And as you say, people change so much in little chunks of their life, you know, um, for whatever reason. And you only notice it when you look back and think, oh, I was like that, wasn't I? Because uh, oh, yeah. you're so not like that anymore, whatever that way is. Um, but yeah, that that I think to is the long answer to your question of the, the period of life that changed me in this way. I think was that you know it, it was I was being forced. I was being forced into submitting to the idea of having patience. You know, it wasn't like you know what it would be better yeah. to be patient. Something happened, and I was like, I need patience. You know what right. I mean? Um, but yeah, I think that was the, the, the main sort of shift for me, yeah. You know, there's something amazing that happens in early, mid-20s and with a lot of people, that kind of like switch in the brain happens. Yeah. And it's actually scientifically, I guess, proven or documented that the brain fully forms around 25 for the male they say around yeah, that the age. prefrontal cortex isn't done growing until you're 25, yeah. which is insane to yeah. think because the drinking age is like 21, yeah. right? Yeah, and <laughs> like I know alcohol has a huge effect on young people, I feel like yeah. growing up. And I'm not here to say that you shouldn't drink or you should drink or anything like that, but I'm kind of glad I waited a little longer mm. to drink, mm. maybe early 20s. And right That's, now, that is good, yeah, yeah. I mean, I had my fun time when I first moved out to LA yeah. that first year because I had been living with my parents even through college I was a commuter and uh -huh. lived at home where are you from uh I raised most of my life in Oklahoma oh shit that's yeah, very but, different yeah but I was born in Syria so we come we're immigrants also very different yeah a, a little Syria to Oklahoma to LA yeah I don't wonder how many people have done that I think two and they're both right here yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> well uh I moved to Jersey New York area when I was like one and a half, two with my mom and dad, mm. uh, William and our youngest brother, Daniel, were born in New York. And then when I was like seven, we all moved to Oklahoma. So, wow. yeah, it was quite the quite the expansive journey. Yeah, you know? yeah, American yeah. dream for sure. My yeah. parents are living and we are living. Um, yeah. But there's something about oh, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah. Like just waiting, waiting a little bit to drink. Yeah. And, oh, that's what I was going to say. Um First year out in LA, I'm super excited. Yeah. I'm out of the house, right? I'm going crazy. And then there was this moment that happened where I was um, serving tables and mm. there was like a restaurant party. It was a Christmas party and, you know, all the drama. I don't know if you ever served tables or anything like no, that. No, okay. no, never. Okay. There's a lot of clicks and stuff right. and like the drama of the yeah. servers and the kitchen and everything. And I kind of like took a step back. I'm like, wait a minute, what am I, 
what am I doing yeah, here? I didn't yeah, come out yeah. here for this. I right, came out here yeah, to be an sure. actor and yeah. be successful actor. What am I? No, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. This is me in like 10, 15 years if I keep up. No, no, I'm out sure, here. Sure, yeah. Yeah, and so there was this like moment of like awakening that happened during that because there was a lot on the line for me, like wanting to take care of my mom and dad and right, the future, yeah. making them, they're, they're all set. So, yeah, man, early 20s are a very interesting time for people. Yeah, I mean, I think that you're at that around that age, you're sort of becoming an adult. Your brain is finishing growing and you're realizing that being an adult is not what you thought it was going to be when you were a kid. You know, I mean, I remember when I was young, I was like, I can't wait to be an adult. (laughs) And as an adult, I'm like, why the fuck? couldn't I wait like this I'm just gonna be this for the rest of my life like I yeah. should have been as a kid like every day being like thank god I'm not an adult yet you oh, know what I mean but okay. now uh I like my life but it's like it, uh, being an adult is not what you think it is when you're a kid obviously and then I think around that age is when you're sort of coming to terms with that whether you like it or not you know you you have no choice anymore uh about whether to be an adult you have to be and even though it's not what you thought it was going to be or wanted it to be or expected it to be you still have to do it Mm -hmm. and i think that creates this weird thing in your in your mind and it forces you to fucking confront a lot of shit that you're probably not interested in confronting you know 100 percent. i mean i think that's that's for anything in life you know even as a working actor Mm -hmm. how i thought it was going to be it's different from it's way different from what i am experiencing there's like 90 percent of the stuff i've learned about professional acting, I learned while professionally For acting. sure, yeah, 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 that is true, yeah. It's you know, all trial by fire. Yeah. And I think once you illuminate yourself to that fact, most people don't know what they're doing. They're just experiencing it in the moment. Totally, yeah. Nobody knows what they're doing, just in general, yeah. Oh, dude, yeah. you're like, oh, you're the same as, oh, okay, I'm not, yeah, I'm not right. nervous anymore. Let's yeah. work this, let's work through this together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, there's a certain amount of work that you have to do with with anything, but you're fine for the most part. Yeah. Yeah. You think you think there's this way that adults are or people in your profession are that you need to be like that. Mm. But the truth is, once you get to what they're doing, whether that's being an adult or being in the profession you're trying to be in, you realize and this can be either a very depressing realization or a very helpful realization or both that really no one knows what they're doing. Mm. And it that sort of feeling of being concerned that you also don't can either go away because of that or increase because of that. For me, it made it a lot easier for me to when I realized, oh, everyone is like this. Even people that are like way older than me still are like fucking insane weird people that don't know what they're doing. And that, I think when I say that, people are like, oh, that's a depressing thought. Not to me. It's like a fucking, that makes me feel great, you know, because uh, it, it, it's a reminder that everyone is in the same position and that's never going to end. And you don't need to ever feel like you don't know what you're doing. I mean, uh, like you said, it's, you got to be prepared and you got to know what you're going to do and know what you want to do and know what you want to say, depending upon what your job is. But nobody really has this shit figured out, you know, especially in what we do. I mean, in, in anything in the arts, it's like there is no set pattern for anybody. In fact, when there becomes a set pattern is sort of when things get boring, you know? For sure. I think the, the the set things are things that apply to all professions and all yeah. life things. Like, hey, don't be lazy. Right, you yeah, know, there yeah, are times yeah. where you can rest and recharge, but you got to work your ass off. Yeah. There's, and there's so much competition more than ever. Uh, continue to learn. Continue to evolve. Learn from people who are <laughs> successful. Dude, that's how I've – one of the main reasons I've become successful is like, okay, I'm going to emulate mm. what the successful people are doing. Mm. And then hopefully that'll work for me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or yeah. else it's like, does this work? Okay, cool. We'll keep doing this for a while. Yeah. This didn't work. Okay, we just this didn't work. Let's recalibrate it or yeah. whatever. Yeah. Um, American Animal. Yeah. I started watching that. I know you did this a while back, mm-hmm. but I just want to talk about it briefly. Yeah. It's so bizarre. Yeah. Just when it first starts off, yeah. it almost feels like purgatory. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Yeah. And yeah. there's this tone that you start getting experiencing from the movie and you continue to watch it and it just it reminded me immediately of I guess she was a friend Mm. I use that word loosely Mm. acquaint no a friend or person I used to know where 
they didn't want things to change. They yeah. wanted things to be the way they are. They wanted yeah. just to stay at home, watch their show, <laughs> drink their wine, go out, but kind of like just stay in that comfort zone. Yeah. And I was like, oh, shit. And it's primarily based out of fear, fear of oh, the yeah. unknown, yeah. fear of the ultimate, which is things that Western culture doesn't think about a lot, but death. Yeah. Yeah. I think Western culture thinks about death. They just like to act like they don't. And that makes us act very weird about it. You know what I mean? Because everybody's worried about it. And you can see it in their actions and and, the, and their beliefs that they're very afraid of dying. But they just don't want to fucking talk about it. You yeah. know what I mean? It's like not. And that just makes it worse and compounds it and makes them act like that more. But yeah, about about the, the movie. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it, a lot of it, the idea of the movie came to me when I was sick and frankly scared about what the fuck was going on and and very just anxious about there's a world out there that I'm not participating in and it's and that I think especially when you're young is like it dements your mind in a way because it's like you know that it's just right out there but you're not able to really get involved and do what you want to do or mm -hmm. really do anything. And I think that that it speaks to the fear you're talking about, because I think that fear alone is relatable, but when you are so um, physically hampered as well, even if you do want to go out into the world, you can't that you sort of start, you can start to your mind can sort of reverse itself and, and, and figure out a way to think, well, everything out there is actually bullshit everything in here is the only real thing. You know what I mean? And that's sort of the, where the idea came from. But what if someone actually took that all the way to the end, you know, and actually sort of lost their mind in this fantasy of like, this is where life is. These four walls are the only place in which life happens, yeah. you know? Um, and that's, yeah, that's sort of where the idea came from. Yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely has an indie film, indie film feel to it, for sure. Which I, yeah. I mean as a total compliment. I know nowadays that's thrown around in a yeah, connotation, I, but um, it made me think. One of the best things about it, I continue to think about the film after I saw it. Mm, yeah, in certain parts, and I think that's one of its big biggest successes, in my opinion. It's interesting that I, with that movie, I, I had there were some people who, who saw it and fucking hated it like true and like let me know like some critics some just audience audience mm. members and one of the critics who said that ended up putting it on a uh, top 10 list at the end of the year so it's like that to me was the best possible compliment because it it i love the idea that someone can see my movie and think fuck this this makes me mad but then you can stew on it and and come around and, and because you're thinking about it so much, it won't go away in your mind. You can realize, well, that upset me for a reason, you know? And, and, and I think, I mean, not necessarily about American animal, but the things that I am, have been most moved by have often upset me at first because you're like, your brain doesn't want it. It rejects it because it's sort of changing your brain, not like changing your mind, but inserting stuff in there that's unwelcome, mm. you know? and hasn't been there before and it's new or whatever it is. And you, you have a knee jerk, like, nah, nah, nah that's, that's yeah. not what I want. You know, often that does mean something's just fucking bad, but sometimes there every once in a while, there's a thing that you reject sort of out of hand. And then you sort of realize you reject it because it was sort of interesting or something you actually were supposed to think about, you know, a hundred percent. And at first, you know, there, there are long, it, it's a slower paced film yeah. at times, yeah. extremely slow. Yeah. First it, half, especially. Yeah. yeah and yeah. I'm just like, all right, this is weird, but I'm still watching it for some reason. Yeah. Okay. Um, the, my mind, this is not the film. If you go watch the film, this is not it. This is my creative brain thinking of, Oh, what if this was this? Uh, the character you play, what's his name? Jimmy. Jimmy. It's it's in his head. It's his alter. Yeah. That's. I was like, oh, that'd be cool if like that's what he wants to be, but he realizes he can't be like that. Maybe he's fighting against to yeah. become the Jimmy. Yeah. And maybe he is Jimmy in in a little bit of his life, but Jimmy doesn't really exist. It's just in his. I know that's not it. Yeah. There but were that's a lot of people. Being creative with it. No, no. There were people. There was some shit online theory that I thought was cool. I mean, I think that after you make a movie, 
you've made it and now everyone else is sort of deciding what what it is mm. you know and there would be there was this sort of i don't know what to call it maybe theory i don't know fan theory i don't know but yeah. that that it was actually they were like the same person and yeah. sort of one person the two guys in it you know and uh i mean they do have the same name and i hadn't really thought of it that way but then i started thinking about it and i was like it does work as that and if people are thinking that and liking it more because of that then they should think that yeah. You know, whatever makes people like my movie more, I want them to think that, you know. <laughs> like, did you mean that? No, but if you like that, then yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, I think for certain projects that works. Yeah. But, and for certain other things, it can be a little bit masturbatory. Yeah. For the, you know, like, oh, look what I'm doing here. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. Him. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't yeah, think that's the I case mean, with this one. I think that when I finished that movie, it was, it was, a, it was a very personal movie, and I was so happy to be, uh, I guess, happy to be done with it, that I, I, that felt like the actual end. And, and I, it was something that I knew people would feel strongly about. The first reviews were really good. The second wave of reviews were, everybody hated it. And then the third wave of reviews, people liked it again. But And when I was making it, I was like, all right, this is the kind of movie that's going to, People are either going to love it or hate it. Yeah. And I'm like, that was, that at the time was comforting to me because those are the kinds of movies I, I really respond to. Uh, like, even if I hate one of those movies, I'm like, I like that that movie exists, yeah. you know? But, but it's different knowing that to be true, that that's the kind of thing you like. And it, that's different than doing it and right. making it and, and experiencing the world be like, fuck you for making this movie yeah. because then you're like um you're saying fuck you to me you know what i mean like it's it's like a personal thing that it took some getting used to um by the end of the cycle i just wasn't even reading reviews anymore and i never i try to never read what people say about my work at all anymore but that was this that was like a fucking roller coaster ish experience just yeah. being like i know everyone's gonna hate this not everyone i mean i was obviously hoping it would be split half and half but like i was like that's i'm proud of that and then people out of the gate it went well and i was like oh it's it's actually the f people were loving it not hating it and then people started hating it and i was like i knew this was going to happen i was expecting this but they're still hating me and that's something else that you actually have to deal with when it comes you know what mm -hmm. i mean um but did you it know. hurt your feelings um no it didn't hurt my feelings it uh there's this weird thing though as maybe it's just maybe it's a human thing but I, it's certainly true of directors that i know there's this automatic you want you want everybody to like it you want everybody to like what you do and as you start to examine that you can see the holes in it but i think it's just like a very natural you want everybody to get it mm -hmm. or like it you know i mean the only thing worse than a bad review is a, is a good review for reasons that uh for the wrong reasons you know what i mean because then you it's kind of a lose-lose reading what people have to say because if people love what you do you're like you read it and then you see that they don't love it for the reasons that you made it or something you know they can be wrong and still love it but and that is also not great it's like I, reading reviews is just so it's like a mind fuck you know sounds it's, like a bad relationship yeah it is yeah it's just like <laughs> leave it over there and just sort of let it go you know you're done when you're done with it you're done whatever people think they think yeah. you know yeah. do you like chuck palinuk yeah yeah i do yeah 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 for sure oh, yeah his writing is some of the best writing in my opinion yeah he's fucking awesome yeah it's so visceral i haven't read a, a lot of his recent stuff but yeah when i was younger I, I i i read all of his shit yeah damned and doomed i highly recommend those two it's like a little girl's journey through hell. Oh. It's like a, a modern day take on Dante's Inferno. Oh, shit. Yeah, that sounds cool. I read it in one sitting, Damned. And I was like, holy shit, this is incredible. When did he write that? Damned was a few years ago, at okay. least. Yeah. Uh, well, well, more than a few years ago, actually, now that I'm Yeah, about. I haven't read that. Yeah. yeah. Um, his, uh, did you watch him on the Joe Rogan I've podcast? seen a little bit of him on that. Yeah. That is honestly one of my top five best podcasts. Really? Ever. The stories he tells on them, huh. I stopped like cleaning or whatever I was doing right, that day. Right, right. I was just like looking at my phone in disbelief. Yeah, he. I don't know if I've seen enough of interviews with him to know. 
is he does his his stories about his own life are crazy you're saying yeah like his writing experiences like he was kicked out of a writing group because they're like you you made us feel like you can't write that yeah, yeah right, <laughs> and yeah. he's like well that's the whole point yeah yeah it is the whole point yeah yeah um, people don't like that point so much anymore they don't like to be offended they don't like to be upset yeah because he's not doing it just to just for the sake of, of course offending. Not. yeah 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 very few people do that and and i think that's a misconception i think when something makes you mad, as in offended, I don't, no one's wait, actually trying to upset. Wait, are you saying very few people do it for the sake of offending? Yes. Oh, I disagree. You think really? people are trying to offend people? I don't think so. I think people are just trying to do what they do. And if people happen to get offended, I, I don't know if it's... I don't think there's a lot of foresight involved in that. I think people should be more prepared, especially for the world now, about what's going to offend people. But I think there are very few bad actors in that sense where they're like i'm gonna do this specifically to upset people you know i mean there's a whole Mm -hmm. troll thing online behavior but i think creators of actual work out in the world okay are not like chuck palaniac people like who are writing books are not like you know what i'm gonna fucking write this entire book and it's gonna make my life impossible for the next eight months (laughs) and i'm gonna do that to upset people i don't think that's right that's what they're up to i think there are fucking people online on twitter who's single purpose on earth as they see it is to offend people and upset people but that they don't fucking count right you know fuck them uh michael how are we on framing we're good good? okay cool cool um yeah that's the things that drive me crazy yeah and certain youtube or instagram stars or social media influencers who do stuff just to like ruin people's day like yeah. random strangers on the sidewalk just mm. to get like a million views and be yeah. a world star it's like that's the stuff that i'm like oh my gosh and then when when news like major news um companies like cnn i, I see some of your shares <laughs> that you post and you don't know how much happiness it makes me when i see like it makes me when you post stuff i'm like oh there's there's yeah. somebody else who gets who gets frustrated yeah. there. This is not news. It's not news, yeah. It's unbelievable the shit you find on those sites. It's like it might as well be like uh, the National Enquirer sometimes. Oh yeah. my gosh, man. Yeah. It's I, so frustrating. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what that is. I, I don't know. Do people click on that? Like is that it has to be why it's there. Yeah. People people clicking on you know, baby just killed by falling air conditioner unit. And you're like, this is fucking CNN. Why are is why is the why is the country or the world needing to know about that unfortunate baby? You know what I mean? Like it's not it doesn't apply if it doesn't apply to more than you know one family, it probably shouldn't be on CNN. You know, no. it's just there to be like a horror story that people click on, and I guess feel something. I don't know. I mean, I don't know if people are that bored. They just need to feel something or what, but. Fox, you know. Fox, Fox does it. So, so yeah. people are like, oh, you're just saying it about seeing it. No, no every, Fox, everybody does it. Fox is worse. I just, I used to listen to Fox just to be like, I used to, just to get the, vi- what I used to do, I would listen to CNN, Fox, MSNBC, all of them, because it was, it was so fucking demented how it was basically like you're, you're listening to news about different countries. Yeah. You know what I mean? But yet. They're all just spinning their version of of of, of what they they believe their audience wants. I guess they're they're right, but that in itself is a obviously a problem. If the the news is the news, it shouldn't be designed to please a certain demographic because then otherwise it's not news; it's someone's opinion, you know. And but that shit, the shit where it's like very very specific horror stories, just like plucked from I don't even know the fucking obituaries i have no idea where they even get this shit you know but like uh there's a headline on there the other day i was talking about on on my podcast it was like um about a cat who like uh a cat who was in solitary confinement (laughs) for releasing other cats from a shelter (laughs) and that was the story like that cat was punished and that that made that made CNN, and that, and that was on the f- the homepage. That w- I didn't have to dig for that. It was like right front and center when I when I loaded the page. I guess I guess people want that more than the actual news. I I am losing faith. I, I really am. I really think the way everything is going, I don't see it turning around anytime soon. Honestly, 
I don't. I'm not trying to be pessimistic. Mm-hmm. I hope it does turn around. I hope we have like this big society and cultural and and human kind of enlightenment, but an awakening. But well, I don't know, man. Yeah, I, I think I think our our blind spots are being sort of exploited. Uh, I wouldn't say like in a conspiratorial sense, like people are out to exploit our blind spots. But when you think about something like that, I feel like it's this natural desire of people to click on things that that make them angry, you mm. know, or make them upset somehow. And 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 because those are driving clicks, those kinds of articles are being written more. And it's not like the news companies are like, well, we want to give people shit that's not news. Mm. But they are thinking this is what people want. We got to give them that. And but that's not necessarily true. It's not what people want. It's what fucks up people's brain in a way and makes them click on it. It's yeah. not that's not a good cycle to get caught in, you know, but we're definitely caught in it. How, how do we solve this then? How do you, how do you think we solve this? I, I don't know. I yeah. think, it, I think, I think what it requires is an understanding of like the kinds of things in general that connectedness is, is bringing to our personal lives. Because like, mm-hmm. unlike any point in the history of history, in the last 10 years, really, I mean, obviously the internet was around for more than 10 years, but the last 10 years, it was like, really, the connectedness took a huge jump with like Twitter, and Instagram, everything like that. And I think that up until now, our brains were only really receiving the things that were in front of us and the news or anything that was happening outside of your life, you had to seek it out, whether that was reading a magazine, reading a newspaper, it depended on, on what your life was, where you were. And before news, it was like you were just dealing literally with what was in front of your face, you yeah. know? Now, even, I mean, I'm not exempt from this. The first thing I do when I wake up is I look at Twitter and it's like, every day I do this. And every day, it brings me this insane anxiety of like, it's not that I'm worried about anything. It's just like you... Our brains are not designed to be receiving 70 streams of information about different things all day long, all the time. It's just overwhelming. And I think people are seeking this like weird familiarity, weird comfort among tribes online. But also when they see clickbait shit like that, it's like this weird release or something, you know, and it's not it's not helping anyone. And I think that that all of that shit culturally really snuck up on us you know like we were not ready for twitter we were not ready to be seeing endless videos of things happening across the world and things happening on wherever the fuck it's just it's too much i think for our brains to handle and no one's really talking about that specifically you know what i mean and um i think it's kind of rooted in that you know people are desperate to not to feel somehow grounded in something, you know? And when you can distract them, that is at least grounding them in that, yeah. Well, you, you nailed it on the head, the groundedness thing. Mm. You know, when you're, when you're going on Twitter or you're in, on Instagram, you're going, oh, there's this, there's yeah. this, there's a chicken in a bikini, there's this, yeah. there's that. Oh, this is a funny video, cool. Oh, there's somebody getting punched. Yeah. Oh, there's, oh, there's my friend, cool. Yeah. There's, and totally, you've just yeah. gotten like the lot, like a, just a, like a, like the climax, yeah. <laughs> basically the orgasm yeah. of, 30 people's lives yeah, yeah, yeah. in 30 seconds. Yeah. It's crazy. And the so, intake is nuts, yeah. And so, of course you're not going to be grounded. You're yeah. constantly like, ah, yeah. ah, you know, yeah. emotionally and ener- energetically. Yeah. I think it's helpful for somebody that, fine, if you if you can't get away from that, that's fine, but you need to find something else that grounds you. I've been yeah. doing some, this is such an LA thing to say, but I've gotten back into yoga, mm. which I appreciate because there's this meditation class that will be doing the same thing for like 11 minutes. Yeah. And it drives me crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But afterwards I'm like, whoa, okay. Yeah. Feel right. feel really settled for some reason, but yeah. it was so monotonous. Yeah. People need that and it's hard it's hard to go back on that. I, I don't know, man. It's it also triggers been- competition and people constantly seeing other people doing things where people are like not necessarily competition like I want to do better than that person, but they're like, well that person's doing that. Should I be doing that? And it stirs up this shit that would never naturally be occurring, you know? Yeah. People usually, up until now, have just lived their life and f- chosen the paths they've chosen or fallen into what they've fallen into and yeah. not had to think about all the vacations everybody else is on 
you know what I mean? All the cool things everyone else is doing. I mean, it's like this curated life thing where you, you can make your life seem way better than it is, but the people on the other end don't know that it's just like the curation. They think that's their life and it makes them feel bad and it makes them want to do that too. Yeah. And it just creates this fucking cyclical thing where everybody's unhappy looking at everybody else being like, well, they're doing that. Well, they're doing that. I should be doing that. This, yeah. uh, you know what I mean? And it's like, no, you shouldn't be doing that. You should be doing whatever you were doing already. I wish there was somebody to tell these people or, you know, or you, if you have kids or whatever, like, hey, this is not their life 24-7. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's it's hard, especially if you don't have anybody telling you. Let's yeah. say you are in your early 20s and you haven't yeah. had this awakening period. Of course, you're going to look at everybody and be like, okay, this is, yeah. all right, I want to be at the beach, take my picture and, yeah. you know, like, I don't know the, I do not know the solution. I'm not smart enough and. I don't know this. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's, it's, I, I think something drastic needs to happen. In, in terms of uh, the comfortability in order for people to change because we yeah. are so comfortable in America. Yeah. There's definitely not going to be a revolution anytime soon yeah, and, and because we're way too comfortable. comfortable. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree. This might be my conspiracy side coming out, but I no. think that's why the, the have you seen in charge... Uh, have you seen any Adam Curtis documentaries? No, who's that? There's this documentarian. He, he has access to all of the BBC uh, news footage ever. So he can make, he makes these insane archival documentaries by insane. I mean like really, really detailed, interesting things where he'll juxtapose certain images and and ideas. But basically he has this one, he he has a recent one called called hyper normalization, which is really great. But the one that I think about the most is this, it's called the century of the self. It's four hours. It was on the BBC, I think in, 1992 and something like that and it's about how after the two world wars uh the democratic governments namely america in particular were were worried about the masses the, the behavior of the masses because if they could do things as terrible as people did especially during world war ii then they were capable of anything and it's made it seem like democracy was precarious and um freud's nephew this guy named edward bernays uh invented public relations and and the thrust of what curtis is doing is that in the wake of the horror that the world saw in world war ii edward bernays positioned himself as someone who had ideas about how to control the masses that government and corporate interests could sort of used to their advantage. And so what he sort of created was this way of satiating these dark desires that people have through capitalism, through selling people things that fed these irrational desires that people had, but didn't lead them to want to, you know, kill 6 million people. Um, I knew it. So it was like this, there was like this, this replacement for these dark desires that was like satiating and as you say making them comfortable it's like letting them sit back their aggression is sort of tapered and you can sort of i mean it it, it actually there's a way to think about it that sounds like a noble effort you know make people not want to be violent or be terrible whatever but really all you're doing is replacing that with something else that's also unhealthy you know so the documentary is amazing it's like one of my favorite things ever made i'll have to check that out man century of the self it's really i mean adam everything he does is amazing but that seems like sort of the crowning achievement of his career it's really really incredible yeah the more i think about it the more scary it is yeah oh yeah no it's terrifying yeah um i mean we're we're getting glimpses of it now with everything that's going on in politics and we i think now more than ever we realize how much politicians lie and yeah, how, how much the people in charge are lying to us. Yeah, it's constantly. endless. Yeah, it's, it's it's overload. It's overload on that for sure. I cannot understand whenever <laughs> uh, this, I, I I lean neither left or right. I'm 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 I'm, uh, I'm opposed to a lot of things. Anyway, I'm not an anarchist, but there was this clip of. Rudy Giuliani saying some crazy stuff, and then the host, I forget who it was, was like. Well, you just here's the t- here's yeah. the clip. We'll play it for you, and he kept on lying about it. Yeah, and I'm like, how can you do that? Yeah, I know. At least have the balls to say like, all right, well, you got me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah, 
I don't know. It's it's very strange. I think that's. I mean, what? Now I think the popularity of podcasts, in a way, is is the response to that, in a way, because I think that was probably on a TV, a TV news, right? That was like yeah. a yeah, and major those, network. I yeah. think CNN, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, yeah, that sounds right. Because CNN sucks, and uh, I, those those interviews happen in like eight minutes, and and everyone's trying to like. A, the anchors are trying to catch other people in lies, make yeah. them look stupid. And the person being interviewed is just trying to defend themselves at all costs until the end of the interview. So until the end of the interview, when you're on TV like that, it's like five minutes. You're going to make it as long as you're being like, I didn't say that. No, no, that's not true. No, no, this, that, whatever. Alternate facts, you know, yeah. shit like that. You can just say that and then eventually the interview is going to be over. On podcasts, I mean, people listen to fucking Joe Rogan talk to somebody like a molecular biologist for three and a half hours. And that shit's unbelievably popular. And that doesn't really make sense if you think about what you think people like. You think people want to see like jazzy, quick shit, you know? But like really what you want to see, what people really have a thirst for right now is the opposite of what you just said Giuliani's doing. And I think that's one reason to be optimistic. People are so... It's the cracks in the old system are so fucking clear. When you can see someone on TV just lying, 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 lying. Nothing happens, and then commercial break. And then another person comes on, and they're lying, lying, lying. It just, nobody wants to see that shit anymore. It's too obvious what's happening. And so with podcasts now, I feel like there's a there's room for longer conversations, more interesting and more sort of nuanced topics, you know. So it's if we're looking for a reason to be hopeful, that is one. But yeah, I mean, network news like that, it's just all bullshit now. It sucks. I mean, watching it, it's like embarrassing, you know, this is so soul fulfilling talking to someone else who kind of is in this same mindset. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Because like I, I hang out with a very small circle of yeah. friends for a reason. Yeah. And, right. um, it's nice meeting a total stranger who kind of shares <laughs> those kind of things. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, because it does worry me because in the future, if I do have a family right. and children, yeah. I'm, I'm already thinking about like my mom and dad, like I want to, you know, take care of them. I'll yeah. buy them a house, have them close by, and you know, just make sure they're doing good because they did it a lot for my brothers and I. Yeah. But I'm like, oh shit! If I have a family too, are my kids gonna go to school? What are they gonna learn? Yeah. Do I? W- am I staying in California? Am I staying in the state? I assume I'm staying in the states. Is there anywhere else better? Is this is this thing just gonna continue to go down? Yeah. Like, how do I navigate them so that they are not in this? the worst type of hell possible, which is you don't even realize you're in a hell. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's, I think it's, there's two things. One is that I fully agree. It's a weird thing to think about having a kid now or a family now bringing new people into this world. We're overloaded with information. That means there's a lot more to think about with why we would do that and what we're really bringing someone into. But at the same time, Throughout history, everyone, at every point in history, there's always been large sections of the population that were saying, this is the end. Society's gone to shit. No time has ever been worse than this. And yet, and yet, and yet, and yet. So, like, I'm not saying that it's not bad now. I actually fully agree with you. I would I would just say at the same time, I do know that that's true. So I think there is this, like, weird presentism bias that everyone who's ever lived naturally mm-hmm. has. And I don't know what to do with that really. Cause I look out at the world and think, uh, I don't know if I can have a family, but the way shit is now, but I also know, I don't know. I don't think that's like a new concern just for our time. I think people have always thought shit like that, you know, that's, that's fair. And I guess I should clarify. I don't think we're at the bottom of the barrel or we're near there, yeah. but the, trage- the trajectory, the trajectory is not good. Yeah, it's yeah. not good, man. I agree, yeah. I mean, <laughs> we grew up with martial arts, so we know what it's like whenever you're in a fight and sparring. And I don't want to ever get in a fight with like a physical altercation, yeah. but I see how enraged people are, these yeah. protests, and how yeah. much violence there is. And I'm like, dude, that riot mentality. Yeah, people are very mad right now. Oh, very angry right now, dude. Yeah. Whenever you're angry, you do stuff you will regret. Yeah. You will regret. It's it's concerning me. But, yeah. you know, 
we talked about a lot more serious stuff than I thought we were going to talk yeah, about, to be honest serious, with you. It's a serious <laughs> fucking Saturday, yeah. Sometimes you got to do it, though, man. Um, I, I, I'm going to lighten it up here it. and express to you how much, uh, A, uh, I think we talked about it in the beginning, but how much I love your dad. Yeah, and how me too. stand-up guy he is, and I hope to work with him in the future. And I've seen clips of you and your mom and dad and the stories Chris tells on yeah. his podcast yeah, as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. And it makes me and William so happy that there, <laughs> there are moms like our mom yeah. out there as well. Yeah. <laughs> Especially with, uh, do you want this? Right. Can, we, can oh, I leave yeah. this in your apartment? <laughs> Just trying to give a shit. I mean, like, I don't, I don't know. I'm not familiar with what it's like to be her, so I can't quite say and it's always a mystery, like, why are you trying to give me so much shit? You know what I mean? Why can't you just throw it away? Uh, it's just this mentality of, like, why why throw something away when someone could use it, you know? Yeah. And she just doesn't want to throw it away. And it's like, do I want, like, a fucking purple and brown ottoman? Like, I, no. Also, like, you know where I live. There's no place for a fucking purple and brown ottoman. You know what I mean? Uh, or, like, do you want this, like... The, like five like winter coats like you want these and i'm like i live in la i'm in la like 11 and a half months of the year you know? yeah but you know oh you guys are moving stuff always moving stuff <laughs> anytime we have to go there she'll be like matt chris like help me move this fucking rug or cabinet or whatever you know what i mean it's just same shit it's not like she's getting new shit all the time i mean sometimes she does but it's like she just just i don't know what's going on everything's got to move all the time yeah i don't know what's up with that well, my mom does this thing with me and where this is the classic story where she thinks I have a short temper and it's mm -hmm. because she repeats things to mm -hmm. me mm -hmm. over and over and over again until I kind of, I don't snap. Do you I, have a short temper? I don't think I do. Oh, right, right. Well, every one of the short temper says that, but yeah. I mean. Does he have a short temper? Yeah. Okay. So. You, <laughs> okay. Do you have a short temper? I do. Oh, and I struggle <laughs> and I struggle with it and I struggle with it. But okay. I'm better about it now. All right. How about this then? Let's say okay, this see, happens. Now he's showing his no, temper. No, yeah, I'm yeah, not. Yeah. Uh, this is no. This drives me crazy. This is not me showing my temper. I'm gonna have to take a break. <laughs> no, seriously. I am passionate and I'm intense about yeah. things. No, I hear you. I agree with you. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, my mom will say, "We Sam, uh, please, William is not answering his phone. Can you have him call me?" I'll be like, "Yeah, mom, I'll have him call you right now because I want to talk to him. Make sure he calls me. I promise you, mom." As soon That's as we're annoying done. already, though. Oh, it goes on. Well, but because I want to talk to him, I'm like, I promise you, mom, as soon as we're done with this conversation, I'm going to call William and uh, he'll have you, he'll call you right back. And she'll go, good. Just please make sure he calls me. I'm like, mom, wow, yeah, no, I am, a, a we Sam, why are you yelling? You have a, such a short temper. And I'm like, <sighs> yeah. And then she's upset. And then yeah. I have to apologize yeah. because I love my mom. Yeah, you got to apologize. Of course. To, to moms. Moms will never be like, I'm sorry. When you're an adult, it's definitely your fault. And to All get it over time. with quicker, you're going to be like, sorry, mom. Oh, yeah. Your mom's not going to be like, you know what? I repeated that too many times. You were right. You know what I mean? Like, this just doesn't happen. That will never happen. Yeah. But uh, I I love her to death. I'm teasing yeah, you, mom. She's course. listening to this. Yeah. So I, you know that, mom. Um, is it weird? Or how does that make you guys feel? Because I will say this. Because of you and Chris, our vernacular with my friends and stuff like that has changed a mm -hmm. bit. Like I say babies for no, yeah. for no reason now. Like, what's up baby? Yeah, what's yeah, up yeah. my babies? Like, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. and, or like, it's a bitch. Yeah. It's a bitch. It's, That's a thing now yeah, with us. It it's weird. It's weird that, cause we've talked like that just, I don't know, so long. Uh, and obviously we've met a lot of people since we started talking like that, the various vernacular things. And every like, period in every group of people we've come into contact with or ones that are still around it there's like a residual effect on them <laughs> like they'll do it too and it's not like they're thinking i want to talk like that it's like this weird uh it's like fairy dusted like you can't not do it it's a weird thing that i've noticed no one's trying to incorporate any new fucking words into their the way they talk they just talk the way they talk right that's why they talk the way they talk because it's natural so it's a weird thing that this like will infiltrate the way people talk. Uh, and my brother and I have noticed it, especially around people that are like in our life, you know? But yeah, I mean, on his podcast, he's, he in particular is so uh, specific in the way he speaks. And I think that it's a very 
easy way to pick up on, you know, it's just like the pattern of it is sort of, I don't know. I can't pretend to know what it is, but that does happen. Yeah. I'm kind of embarrassed to even say that a little bit in no, front of you because true, I don't want to be like that. I don't want to come off as that weird guy's like, I'm a big fan and yeah, we're yeah, using yeah. all the same words sure, you yeah. use, you know? Yeah. Of course <laughs> That's not. so uncomfortable and weird to think but about. I but I appreciate like, you saying because it it's true because it happens. You are not alone. It's like, okay. this is a thing that we've both experienced. And it's like we've missed somehow unintentionally like hacked human brains where it's like, we will make everyone talk like us. But we didn't mean to. Yeah, yeah. Because I the, the sabich thing, yeah. that's something we, we now say when we're all like, oh, that's dude, that, that is the perfect word. Yeah, yeah. It feels good to that. say too, yeah. Oh, dude. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. That's cool, though, that you have such, you come from, you're very lucky that it comes from such a great family as well. I am such a good, positive environment. Unbelievably lucky to come from the family I come from, yeah. I think about that all the time, especially... When I was young, I was just like, "What's my family? Who cares?" You know, like you don't know, you don't have anything to compare it to, yeah. you know. But I think it's really, really so rare, you know. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm extremely lucky, especially they're close too. Like we live, we all live pretty close together, yeah. you know. It's just, it's very good. For yeah. Me, yeah. So I don't have an excuse to have all the problems that I have. I wonder why I have them. Well, you know, usually I people can be like, "I got a fucked up family," you know, like, like this is why I'm fucked up. But now it's like, I got a good family. Yeah. I've got a temper just because I got a fucking temper. I don't know what to tell you. I think that. you're passionate. There you go. Thanks. I'll bring you around with me everywhere I go. He says I'm passionate. Not, no, because not angry. I've only been really angry a handful of times. And that's me like, oh, he's yeah. enraged. I get passionate about stuff because I get excited, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I do have a hard time when someone's like, why, why are you, is your voice raised? And I'm like, because I fucking care. Not because I'm angry. Like this is, I'm happy to be talking about this. The level's going up yeah. because I'm engaged, you know. Yeah. And people be like, "You're, you're getting angry," and it's like, no. Oh, dude, that is the one. I you hate that when somebody says you're getting angry. I'm like, my guy, if I was angry, yeah. you would be a hundred percent sure. Yeah. This is me, yeah. dude. I feel you. That's yeah. frustrating. It is frustrating. Yeah, it is frustrating. Yeah, and then you got to start to be aware of like, am I seeming angry? And that's a hard thing to do because like. You're feeling disingenuous because you're like, I'm not angry, but am I seeming angry? No. It's a weird thing. I love life. You love life. That's what it is. Why do you seem so angry all the time? Matt. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew. Yeah. You should work on that, dude. What's your middle name? You got to work on your temper. Uh, Gregory. <laughs> okay. Matthew Gregory D'Elia. MGD. Yep. I've been doing that recently. I have no idea why. Asking people's middle names? No. Oh. Do it like... MGD, like it's some weird tick that I just started doing. Saying MGD, you think about me? Just MGD, MGD, <laughs> MGD, MGD. MGD. <laughs> Dilly, yeah. Dilly. No, like uh, abbreviating things, right? Oh, 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 yeah. Why? I, I'm kind of concerned actually a little yeah. bit. <laughs> like, I don't know. It's not a sinus infection, is it? I don't know what I. I don't know. Who knows? You should see a doctor for that. I yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I just keep abbreviating things, and something's wrong with me. I probably do have a pill for that. Um, are you currently working on anything uh, other than the you do the podcast uh, almost on a weekly, right? Yeah, every, a new one every week. Okay. Um, I just directed my brother's uh, comedy special for Netflix it's coming out early next year. That's right. How'd it yeah. go? It went really, really, really well. Uh, in Minneapolis, really, really good crowds. I mean, two shows back to back, just both so, so good. I'm so excited about it. I mean, I've never directed a comedy special before. Yeah. And I was excited about it i thought it would be fun but it was actually way more fun than i realized oh. it would be yeah it's uh Great. it's a really cool job because even though i had never done one the people around me were like so fucking pro about how to do it and they were so good at their specific jobs that all i had to do unlike directing a movie where you have to count on many people fucking up and filling those holes this was like oh you're all just gonna do really well and i just get to do what i'm supposed to do like this is rare you yeah. know but there it's a different thing obviously i mean putting on a show for one night is different than making a movie over four or five weeks whatever it is so there's more room to fuck up on a on a, on a on when you're making a movie but it was just very well oiled and no snags it was just like 
all along the process was very good. And Chris was amazing. And it was just, it was a magical, magical night. It was fucking cool. Yeah. And I'm making another movie, my second movie, finally, in, uh, as a director in, in, uh, March and April. Oh, sweet, dude. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Um, it's been a while. It's been sort of making a living as a writer, but realizing I need to make another movie. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, Get the itch. Got the itch, yeah. So I'm really excited about that. That's uh, awesome, man. Yeah. And Chris is going to be in it. Shit. I, I wrote a role for, for Chris. Um, yeah, I'm really excited about it. That's awesome, man. Yeah, yeah. You know, I saw some benefit. Me and my buddy went to Isaiah. We went to a benefit at the comedy store. Mm-hmm. And we had seen Chris before mm-hmm. in... Uh, Riverside, I think. But we saw him that night, and it was like one of those crazy lineups at the comedy store. Yeah. It was like Bill Burr. Yeah. Uh, Brian Callen. Uh, I should know. I can't even remember who. Uh, but no, there was like a bunch of heavy hitters. Yeah. Something about Chris, man. I know. He, he... I've never, I've never seen him bomb or even do badly in any way. He, every single time i've seen him he fucking crushes and i don't even get it because i've seen everyone bomb you know i mean now that i he does it i see so much comedy i everybody has a bad night or, or whatever the fuck and i've just honestly i'm not saying this because i'm biased maybe i am biased but this is not due to bias he just has never ever done badly i've never seen it happen i i'll say this i have when he came up on stage uh-huh. for 10 minutes straight, yeah. it was like the audience was roaring yeah. with laughter. It's crazy. It yeah. was nonstop. Yeah. It was like watching a, like you saw like the black belts go up, right? And then in their comedy, you know, mm-hmm. they got their black belt in comedy. And then you watch Chris come up and it's like a whole fucking, yeah. like 10 other levels. It's insane, yeah. Oh my gosh. Such a talented family, man. Yeah, Such thank a you. Fan- Seriously, I, 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 I'm a big fan of all you guys, and it's so it's such an honor to have you guys on 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 the show, and to share um, these stories that you shared with. I just want to say thank you. Yeah. Um, you guys are good people. Seriously. Thanks, and man. I don't want to take up more of your time and stuff like that. There's a bunch of other stuff I'd like to talk to you about in the future. For but, sure. Yeah. Um. Seriously, it was an absolute pleasure having you on the show. And, Thanks, dude. Um. Yeah, man. Hopefully in the future we get to work together on something. For sure, so, yeah. yeah. Bring me back sometime, dude. Yeah, anytime. It's a good studio you got here. Oh, thanks, I like man. it here. Thank you. Um, Michael, can you play us out? Thank you, Adobe Radio, for uh, everything that you do. Thank you, Nice Guy Digital. Thank you, Tom, for helping us out with the sound issues. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Peyton. Thank you, Matt. You can check out Matt's podcast on uh, Apple Podcasts. Are you on YouTube yet? Yeah, starting to get on YouTube now, yeah. Awesome, great. Yeah. Matt Delia is confused. Check it out. Uh, you can find me at Matt Delia. Uh, thank you, William, for your help today. Thank you to our listeners. Nice guy, digital. Always remember to listen, think, and then talk. We out. <laughs>